tonight on the Fifth Estate. It was the trial that was supposed to change everything. In the dock, Gian Gameshi, a celebrity. Against him, three women claiming assault. Held me up against the wall by my throat, and he slapped me with an open hand. He was on trial, but it would come down to whether his accusers were telling the truth. It seemed to have been a fairly uh, easy case to attack the credibility and reliability of these witnesses. When it was over, he would be acquitted of everything. Gian Gomeshi is not guilty on all charges of sexual assault. And the women would be discredited, denounced by the judge as deceptive, manipulative, deliberately breaching their responsibility to tell the truth. All rise. Tonight, we take you inside one of Canada's most closely watched sexual assault trials. I'm going to suggest you lied. I did not lie. We'll recreate what happened in the courtroom. That's you cuddling with Mr. Gomeshi, right? Yes. Explore what arguments swayed the judge. The oath is spelled out in real, simple language. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And ask what the women, having been so thoroughly disparaged, have to say now. I have to, you know, respect his decisions, but it made me really upset. I'm Jillian Finley, and this is The Fifth Estate. Well, hi there. Happy Tuesday. Well, hi there. My name is Gian Gomeshi, and welcome. He'd been a rising star for more than a decade, the CBC It Boy. Fired after reportedly hurting a woman, outing himself as being into rough sex. In November 2014, charged with sexual assault and overcoming resistance by choking. Mr. Gomeshi will be pleading not guilty. But by then, the damage to his reputation had been done. For weeks, women had been coming forward to newspapers, online, to TV and radio. Pulled my hair, threw me in front of him. More than a dozen accusing him of violence without consent. Held me up against the wall by my throat, cut off my breathing. Most of the women remained anonymous, but actress and Canadian Air Force Captain Lucy Descoteres would step out of the shadows. When police invited those claiming to have been hurt by Gameshi to come forward, she did. People had already seen me talk about what had happened, and for me to not go to the police is, is a slap in the face of the system that I wanted other people to pursue. She would be joined by two other women. Fifteen months later, the case against Gian Gameshi would go to court. February 1st, by dawn, the media had already assembled. Gian Gameshi, a man for whom publicity had once been oxygen, hadn't been seen in public for months, but there he was. Accompanied by a woman who was now almost as recognizable. His celebrated lawyer, Marie Hennen. There was a lineup just to get in. Cameras are not allowed in Canadian courtrooms. All rise. So we've taken the liberty of recreating some of what happened over eight days of testimony. The people you see here are actors, but their words are exactly what was said in court. Be seated. The first complainant was a woman who met Gomeshi in late 2002. Her claim, he assaulted her twice, once in his car where he violently yanked her hair, the second time a few weeks later in his home. And he pulls, pulls my head down, and at the same time he's punching me in the head. And I'm, I'm, I'm terrified. I don't know why he's doing this. I don't know if he's going to stop. Can I take this pain? 
you're on your knees, you get hit in the head. Okay, what sort of happens next? After I start crying, Gion says, you better go now, or it's, you should go now, I'll call you a cab. He didn't say, are you okay? What's wrong? He didn't apologize. He threw me out like trash. Typically, sexual assault complainants have their identities protected by court order. Four weeks ago, complainant number one sat down with us to talk about her experience testifying. I had really no clue what, what it was really like in this kind of a case, the magnitude of this case. The Crown presented her story as cut and dried. But then Marie Hennen rose for the cross-examination. And a clean story was about to get muddy. She started by reminding her about the consequences of lying under oath. Do you remember that the police cautioned you before they take your statement? Do you remember that? Cautioned me about what? That is a criminal offense to make a false statement. Yes. Then it began. The discrepancies, the inconsistencies, every detail parsed. Like the car in which she claimed the first assault happened, Gomeshi didn't even own that car until seven months later. Prior to going to police, she'd told her story in the media. Every difference was now under the microscope. I'm going to suggest you lied. I did not lie. I disagree. Well, did you forget to describe in your words the sensuous kissing that was going on? I was on. focused. Sorry, you forgot that? I was thinking of the main events. The rest, that comes later. That's how I am with memories. That's how most people are. The more you sit with a memory, the more clear. If I had to remember something right off the cuff, you don't always have all the details until you sit with it. It was the police's job to investigate the women's stories, probe their memories, decide if there was a case against Gian Gomeshi. According to the first complainant, though, that process didn't take very long. Two incidents, 12 years old, they questioned her for just 35 minutes. Did you feel that they were investigating? Did you feel no. that they were getting to the heart of what had happened? No. No, they, it just seemed like they were basically asking for you to give your story. Mm -hmm. And periodically they would say, ask a little question in there. It didn't feel like an investigation. It just felt like me blurting out a story. And did you think that this was just the beginning of a process, that there would be more interviews and more questions? Yes. I, I didn't know that this would be it. She says she assumed she'd be interviewed by the Crown, too. But in Canada, that's not how the system works. Karen Bellhumer was a Crown attorney for more than 20 years. Crown attorneys do not have that role of investigating uh, the crime. They take the information provided from the investigator, review it, determine if they think there's a reasonable prospect of conviction, and then their role is to help to prepare the complainant for testifying. The Crown is not an advocate or the lawyer for the complainant. Do you think that comes as a surprise to, to complainants to realize that the Crown isn't there to protect their it, interests? It often does, yes. I didn't stand up and go, what are you doing, or punch him back, or... So like, that one 35-minute police I'm interview the became the crux of the Crown's case. Although she claims it was cursory, the investigators so did ask if she'd had further contact with Gomeshi. She was adamant. She couldn't even stand to watch him, she said. I've always had to you know, see him on television and turn it off, and turn it off, and turn it off. Every time I see him on television, I'm reminded of it, and I try to put it away. They take your statement? Do you remember that? In court, that statement would come back to haunt her. Having insisted she hadn't communicated with Gomeshi, she then said she might have composed an email to him one night, but couldn't remember sending it. Right? I didn't say I sent an angry email. I said I have a recollection of drafting an email in anger. In anger during Q, right? That gave Marie Hennen her opening. I'm going to give you a chance. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell his honor and the court the truth? 
No, that is the truth. You maintain that what you testified under oath yesterday is the truth, right? I do. All right. Hannon then presented her with two emails dated more than a year later, her own words, and asking Gameshi to get in touch, offering her phone number, and most damning, a sexy photograph she claimed she'd forgotten about. You really not remember sending an email with an attachment of you in a string bikini? I'm, I'm guessing this is not something you do every day. No. Did you really not remember doing that? Well, like I had said, I had a, a memory of doing it, uh -huh. but I didn't know if I actually sent it. And when I saw them, I was like, oh yeah, and that's the picture I sent. I remembered them then as I saw them. But up until that point, you had been saying in all your testimony that you had wanted nothing more to do yeah. with him, that you had no more contact. Did you see that that really undercut what you had said? Well, that's assuming that you're looking at it from a point of view of what regular people do. The emails were bombshells, not the kind of thing you'd expect someone to forget. She didn't know the defense had them. The crown was taken by surprise, too. She asked to explain. Please, you want to give your explanation? Go ahead. I wanted Jian to call me so that I could ask him, why did he violently punch me in the head? And if I were to call him and just say, call him, I didn't have his number. If I were to email and just say to him, hi, it's me, give me a call, I didn't think he would. Is that the explanation you're giving under oath? I am giving you under oath that I did not want to see him, that I wanted to talk to him to ask him why. That's not what you say in the email. The email was bait. It was bait. It was bait to get him to call so that I could get an explanation as to why he violently punched me in the head. Put yourself in the judge's position. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a believable explanation? The way I look at it is he's been around for a while. I would assume that, you know, he, he would understand more than the common person would. Do you think the common person would think this was a believable explanation? No, no, I, don't, I think don't. the common people look at it like she did this, therefore it equals that. How damaging was that to the Crown's case? Very damaging. And veteran defense lawyer Joseph Newberger says he doesn't understand why the Crown didn't know it was coming. I've never prosecuted a sexual assault case, but there needs to be preparation. There needs to be a bit more of an inquiry. There may have been in this case. And again, it may be a situation where these complainants simply did not remember or did not want to disclose it. And then all the probing in the world is not going to get it out if somebody doesn't want to say it. Thank you. If there was a way to mitigate the damage, the Crown didn't pursue it. I have no re-examination. It was over. She left the stand feeling confused, but also puzzled. Those emails were more than a decade old. After all these years, I was really surprised. She wouldn't be the only one. When we come back, what else the defense had? So that's you cuddling with Mr. Gomeshi, right? Yes, it is. I didn't know these photos existed. For many women, the trial of Jiang Gomeshi was a test of the judicial system to prove it takes sexual assault and those who report it seriously. Safe to speak! Safe to speak! Thank you. But taking it seriously also means testing the truthfulness of the complainants. Marie Hennon had already dispatched complainant number one. She was about to take on number two. You knew who you were going up against. <laughs> I did. What did you think going in? I mean, this is a conversation I've been waiting to have for a year. Lucy Descoteres knew of Henin's reputation. By now, she had one of her own. Having waived her right to anonymity, she'd become the face of the Gomeshi trial and spoke to us four weeks ago. I knew that all of the hoopla leading up and all of the 
concern was really so I could have a conversation with Marie Hennen about what her client did. Like the first complainant, her story went back to 2003. She was visiting Toronto from Halifax. They'd gone for dinner, a first date. Under questioning by the assistant crown, she testified that it was back at his house that Gomeshi attacked her. He started kissing me, and then he took me by the throat and pushed me against the wall, uh, cutting off my breath, and then he slapped me three times. Had there ever, prior to this happening, been any discussion where you discussed this type of behavior with Mr. Gomeshi? No. Did you consent to being pushed against the wall by Mr. Gomeshi? It's impossible to consent to something that you haven't been asked, so no, I didn't consent to it. Did you consent to him hitting you, slapping? No, you? same answer. Even when we were in court and I was looking at him, I still am like, that's, it still doesn't fully compute for me because it was just a snap. It came out of nowhere, mm -hmm. it didn't go anywhere, and I had nowhere to put it. And you never asked, you never confronted him, no. you never said, what the hell was that about? I never asked him about it because it was something that I sort of felt embarrassed for him to have done as well. Her police interview lasted for about an hour, she says. When I talked with the police, they, talk, they asked me to explain the incident, which I did. At the time, she wasn't even sure what she was alleging was a crime or that charges would be laid. Is there anything else that you haven't told us that we should know? No. Okay. I don't even know what that would be. I'm <laughs> awesome. I don't know. I like your shoes. <laughs> In court, Decouter was asked if she'd had further contact with Gomeshi. She was categorical. After the alleged assault, she said she had no notion whatsoever of pursuing a romance with him. Cue Marie Hennen. Do you remember posing for some pictures? I don't remember that, no. Let's see if I can assist you there. The pictures were from the days that followed. Gomeshi with his arm around her at a party, a selfie of the two of them in a park. So that's you cuddling with Mr. Gomeshi, right? Yes, it is. I didn't know these photos existed. But you do now, right? I do. And that's the man you said earlier choked and slapped you? Oh, he definitely choked and slapped me. I don't remember cuddling with him in the park. That stuff is, I guess, it didn't leave, it, I guess it clearly didn't leave an impression on me. Is it possible, Ms. Decoterre, that you won't remember it until I can show you and I can prove it? Is it possible that you have a convenient memory? No, I don't have a convenient memory. These emails, what can you tell us about these emails that you're referring to? In the police interview, Decoterre was asked about correspondence with Gomeshi. They had exchanged emails, she said, but she no longer had them. Did the police at that point say to you, maybe get in touch with your server, see if there's a way to trace back and find that communication? Did anybody ever suggest that to you? It was never suggested to me that I look for the emails. Now, I did try, and I wrote to the companies involved saying, I'm involved with a police investigation, can you help me find this? But I didn't have any legs to stand on with that. I never heard back from them. And, and anyway, it was never leaned on me. So I was like, okay, well, I guess they don't need it. It's not relevant. They like each other are but in the interview entered into evidence in court, it's clear the police asked more than once. How recently did you look for those? Like a couple of days ago. Because I was like, mm, and they're in my Yahoo account and I can't do you access know them. That account? Like, no. maybe it would. I, I don't Maybe know my we'll password. Get that after the I don't know my game. password. And my password would get sent to my Hotmail account, but that I can't access either because I think Hotmail died. I can't find it. 
Toronto Police Service told us they did try to follow up, but they were unable to access Descouter's account. Suzanne Kernahan is a former Toronto Police sexual assault investigator. These investigators, I'm sure, asked those questions. Did you have other contact? At the very least, they would have said, is there anything else mm -hmm. that you can tell us about this? Or is there anything else that you think is relevant? And quite often, unfortunately, the complainant might think things are not relevant. And at the end of the day, they become extremely relevant and boil down to credibility. And the trial was becoming all about credibility. By now, Descouter had been on the stand for hours. It was the end of the day. But Marie Hennen was clearly, once again, winding up for something big. Ms. Descouter, do you want, before I go any further, do you want to tell the court, do you want to tell his honor about the real conversation that was going on? The one that you haven't told anyone, even today, even when you met with the police? Do you want to take a moment and tell the truth about the real conversation that was going on? I'm not sure what you mean. Your Honor, do you think Whatever she meant, Descouter would have to wait. In a flourish worthy of a TV drama, Hennen then asked to adjourn for the day. At one point she says to you, I'm going to give you one more chance. Yeah. to tell the real conversation yeah. that was going on. Did you know yeah. what she was talking about? No, I did not have any idea what she was talking about. Did, did, I don't know if anybody there did. I had no idea. I couldn't even be upset. I wasn't even worried. That night I went and had dinner with friends and they were like, what is it? And I was like, I don't know. And uh, I slept like a baby. That is the last sleep I've had. In weeks, I slept like a baby that night. When we come back, what Hennen had. Please read the last line of this letter, Ms. Descoter. Having carefully orchestrated a cliffhanger, Team Gomeshi arrived the next morning ready to deliver. On the stand was Lucy Descoter, who'd accused the former CBC host of slapping and choking her in 2003. Tonight, we've reenacted some of what happened in court. Gian Gomeshi's lawyer, Marie Hennen, began by reminding Descoter how she'd already characterized their relationship after the alleged assault. You told the police that you didn't really have any further dealings with him afterwards except professionally, that you didn't engage with him and that you weren't friends with him, that there were no romantic feelings afterwards. Those are your words. Oh, there were no romantic feelings afterwards. I guarantee you that. Do you? Under oath, you're going to guarantee me that. Oh, God, yes. Then came the emails, almost two dozen. Weeks later, telling him he's magic and wanting to get together. Months later, trying to set up a date to play. And almost a year later, still in touch, suggesting a chance encounter in a broom closet at a TV festival. She did meet him at the festival. They sang karaoke together. The song, Hit Me Baby, One More Time. On the stand, she acknowledged the irony, but worse was yet to come. The very next day, July 5th, 2003, the day you say, the day after he chokes you, I would like you to read into the record the email you sent. It was an email she sent just hours after she claimed the attack had happened. You kicked my ass last night, she wrote, and that makes me want to fuck your brains out tonight. The court went silent. Okay, I guess I wrote that. Mr. Gomeshi and I never had sex, and I, it's very, like, I see that this is, makes me look like I had an interest in him romantically, which is why I went to Toronto in the first place. And, um, when I say he kicked my ass, knowing how my brain works, I didn't mean that he, there was no way it was like, I had liked it, 
when you choked me, that's not what I'm saying. Let me talk but it wouldn't just be an email. There was a letter, too. The love letter you sent him, do you remember that? I don't. Clearly, Gomeshi had. It was perfectly preserved, six pages in Decoter's handwriting. I love spending time with you, she wrote. I'm sad we didn't spend the night together. And then came the kicker. Please read the last line of this letter, Ms. Decoter. I love your hands, Lucy. She made me read, I love your hands. And all I could do when she asked me to do that was to read it clearly and own it, because I wrote it. Did you understand the impact that those words had at that point? How could I not? I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. It was, it was a horror show. <laughs> and it was so shaming. It was beyond embarrassing. And she used it to say, well, really two things. One is that whatever had happened that night, you mm -hmm. were clearly fine with it. Mm -hmm. And if it was what you described, well, here was consent. You kicked my ass last night. I love your hands. Yeah. I can see how she could use that in his defense. But, A, I don't remember writing it. I really wish I had, uh, because that would have really stopped my testimony from being blown out of the water. And that is what you have never told the police, and that is what you have never told the Crown, and that was the one thing you were not going to tell His Honor until it was shown to you, right? I didn't know it existed, but yeah. There's no question it was damaging. In court, she explained it as trying to normalize a bad situation. But was it believable? But Lucy, I think what people want to know is, why did you have right. anything to do with them? Why didn't you just go as fast as you could in the other yeah, direction? I know. It, and so, um, yeah, people would wonder that. Um, partly because I wanted to see what I missed. Mm -hmm. What did I miss? I was just trying to... I had to see. Why did it matter? I mean, initially it was because I had a crush on him, but then afterwards, he's the only person who's ever done that to me. I mean, is it simple? And, and if it is, I don't think there's any shame in, in saying it. Did, mm -hmm. I mean, did you still have a crush on him? Did no. you still have interest in him? I never was after him romantically, ever, except for at that first whatever. And so that was never the question. And when I saw him... Each subsequent time, there was just less of that baseline that I liked because uh, it wasn't available. These answers are very muddy. Do you think they're believable, though? Do you think? If strangers don't believe me, that's okay. And if I was looking for a popularity contest, I would not have come forward no. talking about this. This is not offered fantastic dividends. But the trial wasn't over yet. There was one more complainant, a woman who told police that in 2003, Gian Gameshi put his hands around her throat, covered her mouth till she couldn't breathe. What she didn't tell police until just before she took the stand was that she'd gone on to have a sexual encounter with Gomeshi a few days later. Marie Hennen was incredulous. Sorry, he magically appears at your house and you his penis ends up in your hand, and you mess around, and he sleeps over that night, and there's no discussion at all that's sexual? There's no discussion that night, no? There was, not that, it, not that I recall, no. Discussion, no. Is it possible that you just wanted to keep that part hidden? I was embarrassed. I was very embarrassed. In hindsight, I wish that I had told them everything. I still don't think it's relevant. I still don't and the woman that. identified as complainant number that three kind of still insists what world. happened later Despite isn't important. Just because I gave him a hand job doesn't mean that he didn't do these things to me, and that's the bottom line for me. That really is the bottom line. You see where they ask you right at the top? Question Not for Marie Hennen. She reminded the complainant that her responsibility, like the other women's, had always been to tell the truth. 
all three of us had stuff that we held to ourselves that we didn't disclose. I'm sure we all kept it to ourselves for the same reason, is that we were embarrassed, we were humiliated. But you were there and you were under oath. You know, you'd, you'd sworn to tell the truth and the whole truth. And I did. I did. I omitted something, but it was the, I, I didn't lie. It was an omission. A glaring one, I'll admit, but it was an omission, not a lie. Over the course of the trial, all three women had their credibility tested. All three complained that Gian Gameshi never did. But under our judicial system, an accused's right to remain silent is fundamental. He could have taken the stand and given his version of the incidents, but his lawyer's case was almost all about the women's behavior. And even they knew they hadn't held up well. And there was another thing. At the beginning of the trial, the Crown had said it would be raising what in legal terms is called similar fact evidence. The idea that it was hardly a coincidence that three women would come forward independently to accuse Gomeshi of assaulting them in similar ways. What became clear, though, is that two of the women had spent a lot of time leading up to the trial communicating on Facebook. They swapped insults about Gomeshi, made spiteful jokes. They saw themselves as a team working together to bring him down. Their version was they were simply supporting each other. But the clear suggestion would be they colluded. Do you now accept that you, in fact, did tell her about your allegations before you went to the police? I, I explained what happened in a few words, yes. Even the possibility they might have colluded would be enough to sink the Crown's similar fact argument. Former prosecutor Karen Bell Humer. All these years later. So, collusion doesn't just mean that um, you know there is some evil intent on the two witnesses. It can happen accidentally and just make their evidence less reliable as far as it being independent. The Facebooking was a problem, but the real weakness of the Crown's case remained the actions of the three complainants after they said Gian Gomeshi assaulted them. This is the real problem area where there's expectations by society and by themselves of the appropriate way to act. And, you know, I don't think they should be uh, blamed for acting in a human way that's counterintuitive to what you would expect. Probably not. But it's not about blame, says defense lawyer Newberger. It comes back to that issue of consent. So if the complainant in a case continues to see the perpetrator, continues to date them, continues to have intimate relations or has contact with them, suggesting a strong desire to have intimate relations, that really detracts from the reliability of the assertion that the contact in question was not consensual. Uh, maybe we're not saying we don't believe you, but we're saying we can't rely upon what you're saying in a criminal court to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And in a criminal court, reasonable doubt is always the threshold. In closing submissions, the Crown stuck to the three alleged incidents, pointing out the women's accounts of those had hardly been challenged. Notwithstanding vigorous cross-examination, all three of the Crown's witnesses were unshaken in their allegations that they were sexually assaulted by Mr. Gomeshi. The evidence on these key points, the very offenses being alleged, was steadfast. Those are my submissions, Your Honor. And it doesn't require the last word would go to Gian Gomeshi's lawyer. Having questioned the women for days about what they did or didn't do after, Marie Hennon then agreed it wasn't the main point. They just shouldn't have lied about it. The second thing is the oath or the promise to tell the truth means something. In cases for a conviction where a crime requires this court to rely on the words of a witness and nothing else, then their disregard for the obligation to tell the truth is meaningful. The oath is spelled out in real simple language. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Three complainants, eight days of testimony. Gian Gomeshi's fate was now in the hands of the judge. There was
was a time the case against Gian Gomeshi seemed overwhelming. So many women had come forward, at least to the media. But he would be tried in a court of law, and it was in a court of law he was acquitted. Justice William Horkins was scathing in his assessment of the three complainants. They were manipulative, their testimony tainted by outright deception. He had no hesitation, he wrote, in concluding the evidence fails to prove the allegations beyond a reasonable doubt. About the first complainant, the one who claimed she'd forgotten the bikini photo, she deliberately breached her oath to tell the truth, he wrote. About Lucy Descoter, who failed to disclose her ongoing communication with Gomeshi, she very deliberately chose not to be completely honest. And complainant number three, who only at the last minute revealed she'd gone on to have a sexual encounter with him. She was clearly playing chicken, prepared to tell half the truth for as long as she thought she might get away with it. Nice to see you again. Neither the third complainant nor Lucy Descoter would speak to us after the judgment, but the woman known as complainant number one, her identity still protected by a publication ban, did sit down with us again. I don't think that I have ever sat in a, in a courtroom and heard a judge come as close as this one did to calling witnesses liars. Oh, it was awful. I, I couldn't believe he was calling me a liar. I believe I told my truth. I told it as I remembered it as I went along. It's just because I wasn't able to really clarify things. It looked and was presented in a way that I was a liar, but I didn't lie. Once again, she blamed her memory for revealing details in fragments, but the judge didn't buy it. The emails were not something she could have forgotten, he wrote and were completely inconsistent with her vow that she never wanted to see Gian Gomeshi again. When we talked to you last time, and I asked you, do you think this is a story that the judge is going to believe? And you said you thought that he might. He did not believe that story. Well, that's nothing. there's nothing else I can do. There's nothing else I can say. I can't change it to make it more to what his opinion would be. Just because that's not something he understands doesn't mean it's not true. We believe survivors! We From believe the beginning, survivors. there has been no shortage we of support survivors. for the complainants, no shortage survivors. of criticism, too. We believe, we I believe the evidence. We Either way, the trial did focus a debate in this country that the complainants remain convinced is important. Conversation. Would you do it all over again? Yes. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Because I didn't do it to gain anything. And I didn't do it to put him in jail. I did it because I had a story to share. Out of the way. In finding Gomeshi not guilty, the judge did say it wasn't the same as finding the events didn't happen. They hadn't been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. But there's no question the former CBC host has paid a price in reputation, certainly in terms of his career. He may have been acquitted by the courts. It remains to be seen what the rest of the world thinks. There are going to be people out there looking at you tonight who are going to say, you know what, after what you put that man through, he deserves an apology. I deserve an apology after what he's put me through. You still claim that the assaults happened in the way you described happened, even yes. in light of what the judge has said about your credibility today? Yes, and the judge still hasn't denied that they happened. For her part, Marie Hennen issued a statement yesterday saying despite unprecedented scrutiny and pressure, her client had been rightly acquitted. It was left to Gian Gomeshi's sister to speak for his family. It has been extremely painful for those of us who love him. Gian has, however, remained the person that we know and love. We hope that Gian and our family will be given the privacy and dignity to slowly heal from a process that has been extremely difficult. 
But the process is not yet over for Gian Gameshi. In June, he is scheduled to face another charge of sexual assault, one related to his past employment at the CBC.